Thank you, Mike. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tim Menesveta. I'm a senior product manager at ARM. And my talk today is going to be about the recently announced ARM Cortex M55 and the Ethos U55 micro neural processing unit. So the, the trend that we've been seeing in the embedded and IoT uh, space is that more intelligence is gravitating towards where data is collected. And this trend is driving the need for uh, higher compute performance on end uh, processors. The types of uh, compute performance we're talking about here is exemplified by this smart speaker example. So more uh, signal processing performance and more machine learning inferencing uh, performance. So the, uh, the drive for, for more performance, more energy efficiency, and also cost reduction is also driving the need for uh, these uh, compute capabilities to be available on microcontrollers. Uh, and so ARM has uh, recognized this trend uh, a while back and started to think about how we could bring uh, more uh, multifold signal processing and multifold machine learning performance uplift to the Cortex-M processors, which are very common in, in microcontroller implementations. So uh, the first, uh, so we started thinking about this um, and one of the first thoughts that, that came to our mind was, well, let's reuse NEON. Now, as, as you might know, NEON is a SIMD or, or single instruction multiple data vector extension that's already available in the Cortex-A world. Um, and we've, we've quickly found out that it wasn't suitable because it was, um, although the SIMD architecture fits nicely into the Cortex-M world, uh, in fact, a few Cortex-M processors today, like the Cortex-M4 and the Cortex-M7, already support, to a certain extent, SIMD capabilities. Uh, but NEON was just too big. Um, it's got a very large register file that would have implied that uh, in the Cortex-M world, we would have had to um, uh, uh, change the hardware uh, register stacking mechanism and possibly impact the short interrupt latency that is a, a hallmark of, of Cortex-M processors. Uh, and also in terms of microarchitecture implementation, the ALUs, the MAC units were, uh, were just a bit too large for, for Cortex-M implementations. Uh, then we thought about uh, going superscalar um, and in fact, the Cortex-M7 today uh, all already supports dual issue of, of instructions. Uh, but if we were to improve on that and go triple issue, say, uh, it would have increased significantly the area uh, of a Cortex-M processor without bringing too much uh, performance uplift. Plus, we had to uh, think about how to add new data types as well um, to, to, to make it suitable for, for accelerating uh, signal processing in ML. And finally, uh, we also thought about uh, very long instruction word architectures that are uh, quite common uh, in, in DSPs today. Um, one of the first issues with VL, VLIW is that it, it breaks the compatibility with, with the uh, older generation Cortex-Ms. Um, and also uh, compilers uh, for VLIW would have have to have good knowledge or, or intimate knowledge of how many lanes uh, in parallel uh, are available for execution and also what are the hardware resources in those lanes uh, are available. And so one, uh, the compi compiled code for one Cortex-M VLIW processor would not necessarily uh, run on another uh, uh, Cortex-M uh, processor. And this is something we, we don't want because we want uh, across the board compatibility with, with multiple uh, Cortex-M implementations. So what we did was we designed from ground up a new vector, vector extension engine for the Cortex-M processors and we called it Helium. Now as, as you note, uh, Helium is a noble gas on the periodic table. Uh, it is slightly lighter than neon in atomic weight 
So the name is intentional. And Helium was announced uh, early in 2019, so last year. Uh, and about a year later, we announced um, the first Cortex-M processor with Helium uh, implementation, the Cortex-M55. So Helium is a vector processing engine. Um, it has eight vector registers, of, uh, each 128 bits wide. Um, we are reusing the um, uh, floating point registers here, so trying to make uh, uh, um, area as, as efficient as possible. There are over uh, 150 new instructions in this uh, uh, architecture extension. Uh, over 130 are vector instructions, and, and the remaining 20 are new scalar instructions that support uh, uh, signal processing and machine learning type uh, use cases. Um, the data type supported by Helium um, is 32-bit, uh, 16-bit, 8-bit fixed point, uh, and single precision and half precision uh, floating point. So particularly the 8-bit integer and the 16-bit floating point data types are new to the Cortex-M world. And we will see later that this does bring uh, significant uplift in performance uh, for processing uh, things like neural networks and, and audio, uh, audio DSP type processing. Um, the Cortex M55 is highly configurable, so uh, pretty much all the functional blocks are configurable, whether or not, whether it's uh, completely enabling and disabling them or configuring them to, um, uh, with a range of, of options uh, in, in how much functionality they bring. So for example, you could completely configure out ECC support if that's not needed uh, in the memory interface buses, or you could uh, add a coprocessor interface if a tightly coupled coprocessor was, was needed for the design. There's also a new memory system design that's optimized to not starve this new CPU that's hungry for data, uh, for processing data. So a more uh, a sophisticated memory system design to, to allow high data throughput into the, the processor. And of course, because it's based on the ARM V8M architecture, um, it supports uh, Trust Zone, which uh, brings this uh, a hardware enforced isolation between the secure and non-secure resources on the device. So the design of Helium um, is uh, meant to span a broad spectrum of performance points. So for the very small designs, Helium can be implemented with a 32-bit data path. Um, and for the really high performance, 128-bit um, uh, data path. Uh, so this is in one cycle, you can do 128 bits of, of data processing. Cortex-M55, uh, we've decided to pick a sweet spot um, in the middle. Uh, so it, is, it has a 64-bit data path, which means that in one time clock tick, um, essentially 64 bits of data can be processed per, per clock cycle. Um, now, what, what that means is another aspect uh, of, uh, of Helium is that Helium instructions, some of them can also be overlapped. Uh, and this is uh, uh, important for pipelining some of the typical um, signal processing operations such as filtering or, or vector dot product. So you can overlap uh, a six, uh, 128 bit um, uh, vector load uh, with a, another 128 bit uh, MAC operation, for example. So, in the case of Cortex M55, it can sustain a 64 bit MAC operation. So, during that clock tick, uh, the processor is loading a new set of 64 bit data. And during the same clock cycle, it is doing the multiply and accumulate on the previously loaded um, um, data. Another aspect of uh, optimization that was made to the design is the memory system. 
So in many ways, the memory system of the Cortex-M55 is similar to the Cortex-M7. Um, it supports uh, tightly coupled memories for real-time uh, requirements and also has internal layer one caches for supporting higher latency uh, memory. On the left in the block diagram, you see the TCM interface um, and there are four 32-bit uh, um, buses to, to data, tightly coupled memory banks. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, Cortex-M55 has the 64-bit internal data path. So two of those data buses are used for fetching or reading or writing 64-bit uh, um, um, in a single cycle uh, to, to the tightly coupled memories. The additional two um, data uh, buses allow for an external DMA controller to access uh, those uh, tightly coupled memory banks in order to support a streaming type of operation where data is coming in from the sensor or going out to the sensor concurrently at the same time as the processor is operating on, um, on, on data um, in, in the tightly coupled memories. At the bottom, we have a 64-bit master AXI interface um, with configurable I and D caches. Um, the sizes of these are uh, up to 64 kilobytes each. And on the right-hand side, we have um, an AHB peripheral port. So you can attach uh, legacy AHB peripherals or low latency peripherals to directly to this port um, rather than uh, through the main, main bus. Uh, so it, it, there's a chance to uh, reduce contention uh, or traffic uh, on, on the main bus. So beyond the uh, uh, vector processing capability, there are also uh, various uh, DSP-oriented processing support that has been added to the Cortex-M55 and Helium. Um, these features are typical on, on, on DSPs today, um, low overhead loops, uh, various types of addressing in order to efficiently fetch and write data uh, to memory. Uh, complex number processing has also been added as well. So overall, we want to bring the capability for Cortex-M for processing uh, DSP type workloads as well as machine learning inferencing workloads up a notch uh, by, by, by several factors. So what do we see in terms of performance? Um, this is a graph uh, showing the comparison of Cortex-M55 running SimSys DSP kernels. So these are FIR, FFT, uh, matrix uh, multiplication, biquad filters for various data types. And as you can see, the performance here, higher is better. Um, M55 brings multifold performance uplift compared to previous generation Cortex-Ms. Um, and all this data is uh, normalized to the performance of the Cortex-M4, which is quite popular in the market today. Uh, particularly if you note on the uh, um, 8-bit fixed point uh, data type and on the half precision floating point data type, the uplift in performance is, uh, is is, is more, and this is because of the, the, that these new data types are newly supported on the Cortex-M55 and were not present uh, on the previous process processors. Now, in terms of machine learning, um, we've also uh, benchmarked the uh, keyword spotting. This is an inter internally developed keyword spotting algorithm that is shared on GitHub and is available. And again, we're seeing um, over seven to eight uh, uh, times performance uplift for the M55 versus the Cortex-M4. Um, all the data is here and you can, you can uh, uh, once you get the, the slides, you can check the link as well to, to get the actual reference code for this. So, um, Shifting gears a bit, um, 
we do realize that uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence spans a very broad spectrum of performance points, both in terms of latency requirements as well as uh, uh, data throughput. Um, today, you have Cortex-M implementations that are already doing some form of machine learning inferencing. Um, Cortex-M55 certainly brings significant uplifts uh, uh, to that. Uh, but uh, we're, what we've announced uh, recently, um, earlier uh, in, in February, was the uh, first uh, micro uh, neural processing unit from ARM called the Ethos U55. And the combination uh, between, with, with an M Cortex M55, we believe, is going to bridge the gap uh, for deploying uh, machine learning uh, inferencing and, and signal processing uh, to endpoint AI, uh, bridge that gap uh, to, to up until to, to um, the high performance Cortex-A's GPUs uh, and the higher performing Ethos N uh, processing units. So the uh, Ethos 55 is the first micro neural processing unit from ARM. Um, it is uh, specifically designed to accelerate um, some neural network uh, uh, operators in hardware. It works alongside the Cortex-M, so you need a Cortex-M to act as a host. Um, it is connected to the, the memory bus, uh, so it uses the, um, the system SRAM uh, and, and flash uh, that is available. Um, it is designed to accelerate uh, uh, um, operators from, from neural networks, uh, and it does include um, um, uh, weight compression mechanism. So there is a, an on-the-fly weight decompression logic in, uh, included uh, in the Ethos U55. Now, weight compression is uh, is, crit is very important uh, for embedded systems because of the limited memory uh, uh, availability. Um, so there are two benefits uh, for providing on-the-fly weight decompression. One is you're then able to run larger networks um, that would otherwise would not have fit uh, in the available flash memory. Um, the other benefit is performance. Um, some of the uh, networks are weight load bound. So the fact that there is less weight to fetch from memory does help also accelerate, uh, increase the performance for, for those networks. The uh, U55 supports 8-bit uh, or 16-bit activations. Um, weights are always 8-bit. Uh, it is a configurable NPU uh, with uh, 6, 32, 64, 128, or 256 8-bit max per clock cycle. So if your activations are 16-bit, uh, it would use two, two clock cycles per Mac. Let's look at a typical a data flow for um, the, mic, the um, Ethos uh, U55. Um, so at, at the start, um, offline compiled command stream with corresponding compressed weights are loaded into system flash. Um, then we have activations, which by the way are coming from sensors or uh, have been pre-processed by the Cortex-M55. Uh, this would then be put into uh, system SRAM. Uh, the host Cortex-M then starts the ethos uh, U55 by uh, defining all memory regions to be used and also the, tells it the location of the command streams and the input activations. Ethos U55 then autonomously through its DMA engine um, run those commands, it uses the system SRAM as a scratch buffer uh, and then writes results uh, to a predefined uh, SRAM buffer location. And finally, once the final uh, uh, results have been written, it generates an interrupt to, to the Cortex-M CPU. So fairly simple um, uh, data flow and command uh, operation that relieves the Cortex-M also from doing its own stuff so the Cortex-M isn't completely blocked while the NPU is, is uh, 
is working. So um, how does the uh, network get run on the Ethos U55? So the team at ARM looked at various uh, popular neural networks to identify good candidates for acceleration in hardware and pick those operators um, to implement in hardware. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of these networks will completely run on the Ethos U55 without requiring any CPU cycles. Um, ResNex 50, WAV to Letter, and also Deep Speech would run completely uh, on the Ethos U55. Um, for networks that cannot be completely uh, uh, mapped to the U55, the remaining operators would then fall back uh, and, and get executed on the Cortex-M, which would be accelerated by uh, the Simsys NN library. This is something that is available, again, uh, on GitHub uh, and uh, um, implements uh, these operators uh, um, with, uh, with the accelerate, with an efficient implementation uh, of, uh, of those operators on the Cortex-M. For most of the popular networks, um, including um, uh, uh, mobile nets, um, uh, for example, in DSCNNL, all the operators do run on the Ethos U55, except for softmax. Um, so, so only one uh, remaining operator gets uh, mapped onto software on the cortex M. What about the software development flow? Um, so the process starts with taking a network that is either off the shelf or retrained, uh, a TensorFlow uh, network, that that gets quantized into the TensorFlow fat, flat file um, using the 8-bit integer um, um, quantizer. The ARM supplied NN optimizer then works on the flat file as input and graphs out which portion gets mapped to the Ethos U55 and which portion gets uh, mapped to the Cortex-M. In addition, it's also doing the um, weight compressions. So it optimizes schedules and allocates the graphs. Then that uh, executable gets loaded onto hardware. Um, and uh, in addition to that executable, um, the Simsys NN libraries, um, the Ethos U55 driver, uh, and the reference, the, the TensorFlow reference kernels in case um, some of the operators cannot be accelerated by Simsys and then it would fall back onto the reference uh, um, uh, TFLU uh, reference kernel. So all that gets mapped onto, onto the device and that's how, uh, um, that's how it works. So just ha let's have a look at a, an example uh, to see the, the performance uplift that we're able to, to bring with this new system. Um, the combination of Cortex-M55 and Ethos U55 is really suitable where you need the Cortex-M to do signal conditioning, signal processing, such as in this case, uh, doing noise cancellation, voice activity, activity detection, beam forming, uh, et cetera, and also keyword spotting. While the Ethos U55 is running at a lower clock frequency or even uh, asleep, and when the system is woken up and there is a chunk of speech that needs to be interpreted, um, Ethos U55 can be used for um, automatic speech recognition. So the combination of the two uh, is, is very suitable for um, bringing energy efficiency uh, and, and also simplifying the, the design of a lot of these endpoint AI uh, devices. For this particular use case, um, 
when we compare the performance of a Cortex M55 and Ethos U55 versus a Cortex M7, we're seeing over 50 times uh, increase in the speed to inference uh, and also um, over 25x um, increase in energy efficiency. Now, the energy efficiency um, we're seeing is, of course, because we're so able to do this job so much more quickly, despite the fact that there is some additional uh, hardware uh, on, the, on the device. So this is very suitable uh, for, for endpoint AI, leads to faster response time, leads to opportunities to improve accuracy for inference and also uh, enables uh, new designs with smaller form factors to, to, to be built. So in summary, um, can a Cortex-M processor uh, be built to do DSP and ML? Uh, yes, uh, Helium um, brings a, a multifold performance uplift uh, for DSP and ML to traditional Cortex-Ms, while at the same time maintaining software compatibility uh, and also maintaining that goodness of, of Cortex-Ms, of real-time, ease of use, uh, low power, and security. And the combination of uh, Cortex-M55 and the Ethos U55 uh, definitely brings uh, um, unprecedented performance to endpoint AI, uh, um, to, 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 to the embedded uh, market. I think that was my flat last slide. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, and um, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Let's start with one on, on comparing the, the Cortex M55 to previous generations, uh, not just for performance, but for power and area. Uh, how would it compare to say the M33 or the M4? Um, in terms of, uh, when we talk about power, we um, need to distinguish between scalar power and uh, vector processing power. So if you're running something like dry stone, um, certainly the Cortex-M55 will be drawing more power than Cortex-M33, than M4. Uh, but if you're running um, uh, a DSP heavy workload that uh, is utilizing the helium vector extension. Um, power will be higher, but that job will be done much, much more quickly, much more faster. And so in terms of energy, um, uh, that energy consumption we've measured is, a re is being reduced by a factor of two or three compared to, um, compared to a Cortex-M33 or an M4 on average. And you mentioned increasing the number of ALUs, increasing that area, but overall, is there a big penalty in the area for the M55? Uh, it is bigger, um, certainly. There's more stuff in there. Um, just as a very rough guideline, um, without going to specifics, the M55 in area sits somewhere in between a Cortex M4 and a Cortex M7. So, so you're still getting a very efficient small Cortex-M processor. Um, um, and in, in a lot of implementations, in fact, um, memory sizes tend to uh, uh, become more prominent in, in the design versus the actual core size itself. Yeah, sure. And then when you add the U55, uh, how does that compare in terms of the, the die area and additional power? <laughs> So again, um, just roughly um, real thumb wise. So in the, as, you, as I mentioned, the Ethos U55 is configurable um, from 32 up to 256 uh, max per, per, per cycle. Uh, in the largest uh, configuration, roughly um, you, you're doubling the size um, of, of the, the, the Cortex-M. So, so you have a, an, an M55 on one side and then you're having a you're essentially multiplying by two the area. Okay. Okay. One of the, the audience questions is about whether you have a measurement of the, the memory bandwidth and the performance 
uh, associated with the memory bandwidth. I'm not sure. Memory bandwidth and performance spec, I guess, is what okay. they're in. So um, the, in terms of the, um, um, in terms of the Cortex M55, um, it is you know, with the TCMs, uh, that's 64 bits uh, per clock cycle that can be pulled in. Um, the, certainly the L1 on the, on the main system bus, the L1 cache uh, for data and code that helps with um, um, higher latency memory in the system. So the highest throughput possible uh, is 64 bits uh, per clock cycle on the N55. Um, and on the Ethos U55, which has an internal DMA and is pulling its own data from memory, um, if you don't mind waiting until the breakout session, um, I'll be able to grab that answer for you. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I think in, in the, the larger ethos uh, uh, accelerators, you include the uh, Winograd convolution. Does the smaller U55 use that as well? No. Um, again, I don't have the list, the full list of uh, operators that are supported. Um, and in the breakout session, I'll be able to answer that question. I'll be joined by a colleague uh, from, from the ethos team. Uh, but the, certainly the number of operators um, that are supported on ethos U55 are, uh, are, are, are geared towards uh, more, more the embedded and IoT space. Sure, <clears throat> okay. So you, you showed an example of keyword spotting, and that seems to be one of the popular applications for these low-power uh, embedded MCU-type applications. Uh, how many words can that particular model classify? That particular model that's available on GitHub is uh, recognizing 10 words. Um, now this is, of course, very light, lightweight, um, and it's being used as a benchmark to compare um, M55 with the previous uh, Cortex M's, just to get a rel relative mm -hmm. um, uh, performance point. Um, certainly, um, we think the M55 alone, without U the U55, capable of, of doing more, um, and um, and I, you know, we we do we do have some performance data running um, larger networks on M M55 as well that, that uh, we can uh, share with uh, interested uh, partners um, if they contact us. Do you have any uh, other networks besides that that you have performance data on? Uh, well, certainly the ones I've mentioned uh, in the presentation, these are the, the more well-known ones like um, uh, WAV to letter, uh, mobile net, DSCNNL. Uh, the, these are our networks that we've benchmarked across all the Cortex M's uh, and also, um, of course, on the Ethos U55 as well. Uh, and seeing you know, significant uplift by adding the Ethos U55 you know, hundreds of times faster. Um, um, so, in, in general, the, the but where we see the value of having an M55 plus a U, U, Ethos U55 is the M55 is a more general purpose vector processing uh, uh, engine that can do signals conditioning, preparing the data for inferencing. And the Ethos U55 uh, would then uh, accelerate the inferencing based on the, the network that is chosen. I just, are you sharing that publicly or is that just for your customers? Uh, just for our customers, uh, we, 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 that, that type of data, as well as detailed PPA data, we'd like to share with, uh, with our silicon partners, yes. Sure, okay. Uh, just since you, you're in a good position with, with uh, offering IP to, uh, to lots of different customers, I'm just wondering, maybe you could comment on some of the trends you're seeing overall for embedded AI. Um, a lot of interest, um, and as you know, ARM is part of a long supply chain uh, that feeds into this industry. Um, 
And so what we're working on today sometimes don't show up in the market for another year, another two years. Um, and so, but we're certainly in very active discussions with a lot of our silicon partners on um, what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the need to have more efficient compute uh, <clears throat> on Cortex-M uh, and, and Cortex-M specifically because there's such a large pool of developers who are familiar with the flow and they want that capability which before might have required a more heterogeneous architecture or something based on Cortex-A with Neon. So, so the need to make ML accessible to, to programmers um, is, is, is driving the need for, for, for what we're doing today. Um, and I would, the other aspect I might mention is the performance requirement seems to be insatiable. Um, you're, you're, you're seeing more and more uh, Cortex M implementations pushing frequency. Um, and, and the end customer, the OEM designers, are pushing the silicon suppliers to add more and more performance. And capability to their to their products and so that gets trickled down to arm sure yeah yeah we've seen pretty high clock frequencies on cortex m cpus recently mm -hmm. um, these are particular application though you see more uh, we tend to see a lot about about the object recognition and computer vision but are there other new applications that you see uh customers are developing um, they, they tend to all fall into the three V's, right? So um, video or image, voice or sound, and then uh, vibration and motion. Um, certainly Cortex-M kind of spans the whole uh, lot, but you know, of course for, for higher end uh, video image pr um, processing where real time requirements are strict, um, you might need need a higher performance than what Cortex M's today can can provide, but for you know object classification, um, lower frame rates, you know that's very suitable for for something that that a Cortex M plus an EFOS could could deliver. Mm -hmm. um, the voice sound recognition is very broad, uh, and and performance requirements are also uh, being pushed more and more. Um, um, and then and in, in the, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the voice, uh, sorry, the, the vibration and, and motion sensing sensor fusion, um, I'd say the classical ML techniques um, using stochastic methods rather than neural networks uh, is, is something that, that is prevalent today, but we're also, you know, there, there are ways to make them simpler and easier to, to, to deploy. Um, and that's something that that is uh, also uh, active, actively happening as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's across the board. Sure. Uh, since your role involves uh, you know, strategizing the future roadmap, uh, are you looking at uh, some of the techniques that you saw in the in the ter earlier presentations of, of say, uh, lower precision quantization, uh, even binary neural networks? Are you looking into that? Yeah, so, so we, we did, um, I think, one bit um, weights uh, or, or binary neural networks were, were something that we saw earlier and, and, and uh, you know, in, in a way, when we start to define a hardware uh, accelerator for, for neural networks, the pick is where the majority of use cases can be in the next few years um, and, and I don't I think perhaps I'll, I'll leave it to, to the breakout session for my colleague from from the uh, machine learning group to, to comment but I, I, I think we didn't see the, the momentum um, um, for uh, for really uh, optimized networks um, to, to go mainstream at that time so mm -hmm. as you know we're working closely with Google um, and and we, we we want to 
kind of find a sweet spot where, where it's um, um, the, the hardware that we bring that people pay to, to put on their silicon uh, has the most use. And so yeah. that, that's where, where it's going um, mm. initially, yeah. Yeah, but it does seem like there is a trend we're seeing more of the, the lower precision developments that, that would be ideal for reducing power in embedded low power applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, good. Um, I want to thank Tim and, and also our previous speakers. We're just about out of time for this session. Uh, we'll be going over to opening up the breakouts uh, at uh, quarter before the hour. Uh, and we'll see you over there. Thanks very much, everybody.